So for now, let's head back to Edo, the city that became Tokyo. Um, this incredible flourishing metropolis and the beautiful wood block prints that it produced. And today we're going to be exploring the peace and prosperity of Edo, but also where those printmakers, those publishers and those artists started to brush up against the authorities as well through censorship. So in the exhibition, we have um, divided the exhibition into a number of themes, and that's to help approach the relationship between woodblock prints and the city of Edo. So we've got the first theme is selling the city, selling Edo, and that's the printer's black ink, the publishers, the players, the process and the audiences. Then, um, as I talked about last time, we have bravura and chic. So that's the theatre, the crimson paint of Edo's dynamic Aragoto actors, the identity and the fans that they gathered. And we have chic, the fresh green of the greenhouses, the brothels of the licensed prostitution districts, fashion and sophistication. And all these themes overlap. But in this third talk, I'm going to be focusing mostly on the last two themes of the exhibition and those are the glinting gold of prosperity images of the thriving metropolis and the white peak of Fuji and Edo's pride in place. Um, but I'll also be exploring an important issue that permeates all of the exhibition just as it permeates all of Edo's printmaking and that is that as well as the publishers, the artists, the writers, the block cutters, the printers and the audiences, there's one other really important player to add to the mix and that is the Tokugawa shogunate. Um, so these are the de facto rulers of Japan from around 1603 to 1868. They are the people who created the city of Edo as their capital and then ruled from it. Um, and they also had very strong opinions about what people should and shouldn't be doing. Um, and that comes through as censorship. So today, as well as looking at beautiful prints, we'll also be thinking a little bit about authority and censorship and then juxtaposing that with creativity and resilience. And it's vital when you consider the image of the city that's created in Japanese woodblock prints to have these issues in mind. They don't have free reign to do exactly what they want to do. They're operating within a certain scripture and a certain sort of framework. And that's where we'll be starting off today. So where to begin? And there's certain kinds of prints that I really love. And this is one of those kinds of prints. And so we're going to start with a dream. And this is a beautiful print from around 1773 by an artist named Utagawa Toyoharu. And it's divided really interestingly into two parts. So it's part of a untitled series of day and night scenes um, done by more than one artist actually. And here, the division actually seems like a presentation of a dream. So in the lower half of the picture, separated across the diagonal, we have this young musician, very beautiful, elegant young musician there. And he's dreaming under the autumn leaves, and he's possibly about to be woken up. But while he's dreaming, he's dreaming of a future where he is a wealthy merchant and he's entertaining all his acquaintances with a wonderful feast and drink and everyone is having a great time. And in the alcove over here, if I can get my little laser pointer working again, um, we can see a statue of the god Ebisu. And actually they're celebrating the festival of Ebisu. And Ebisu is the god of traders, the god of merchants. So he's imagining a future where he is a wealthy merchant and he's enjoying that prosperity of Edo. Um, and we find that same um, Ebisu, the lucky god, here among his uh, compatriots, the seven lucky gods, riding their treasure ship through the waves. And this is partly just to introduce the fact that art can play different roles within society. And in the case of Japanese prints, as well as being beautiful images, as well as being artworks like we might appreciate artworks today, some of these prints actually held a particular kind of agency. They held the power to change things in people's understanding. And in the case of Japan, images could be called upon to halt disease or to hasten renewal following a disaster. So we get prints that show catfish, catfish being the creatures that cause earthquakes. Um, so a giant underground catfish shaking is what causes an earthquake. So a print of a catfish might help either avert an earthquake or help bring good fortune through the reconstruction and all the jobs that brings. Um, or as we have here in this image, 
uh, we get red images. Images done in red were thought to be particularly effective against smallpox, and none more so than images in red of a fellow called Shoki. And Shoki is a uh, Chinese warrior, well, Chinese official, and he was cheated out of first rank in civil service exams. But when the Chinese emperor heard that he'd been cheated, he buried him with full honors. And so to thank the emperor, Shoki appeared later and offered his services to quell demons and banish disease, something very handy for the times that we're now in. And these images were particularly displayed around the boys' festival to give um, good health and well-being to children. Um, but the treasure ship itself is, is one of my favourites. And the treasure ship is something that um, can bring good fortune and it's used at New Year. So if we go back to the picture book contest of Beauties of Green Houses that we were looking at in the last talk, you can see here on the left, we have a young lady called Ukifune, whose name appropriately means the boat upon the water, another name from the Tales of Genji. And she is holding in her hands a copy of a print of a treasure boat, very much like ours. And she's ready to put it under her pillow to bring her some lucky dreams. And this is what you're meant to do with this print. You're meant to put it under your pillow um, at New Year and it will help bring you good dreams. So over the top of the, over the, top of the print here, um, we have a poem written. And the poem reads, after a long night, deep in slumber, we open our eyes to hear perhaps the sound of a boat upon the waves. And this is a poem about the arrival of the treasure ship of good fortune, coming into harbour at New Year, bringing blessings, bringing prosperity. We have the crane flying overhead and the turtle in the waves, both good symbols of long life. We have the seven lucky gods themselves, all bringing very auspicious tidings. And we have my personal favourite on the back of the boat here, this is a creature called a baku. It looks a little bit like an elephant. Um, the name baku is actually now used in Japanese for tapir, but it's a mythological creature. It has the trunk and tusks of an elephant, the eyes of a rhinoceros, the tail of a cow, and paws of a tiger. And the important thing about having a baku on your boat at New Year is the baku will devour any nightmares, ensuring that the dreams you have are good, happy, and prosperous dreams. So it's not just a beautiful image, it's also one that could change your fortune. And the first night of the new year, the first dream you want to have is the dream, the classic dream in Edo is to dream of Mount Fuji, a hawk and eggplants. It may seem like a curious combination, but this is the winning formula for prosperity and good fortune ahead. So when we delve more into the prints that I'm going to show you, I want you to just remember one thing in particular. The Edo that we see in print is something like a dream. To see Edo in print, see artworks, is to see refractions, not reflections. It's not a document of lived reality that we're looking at, and there are certain aspects that will always be invisible and certain aspects that will always be brought forward. These are things that were made to sell, so they have to appeal to the buyer. Um, and they're also being made within a very specific framework that means that they can't show you everything. So the prints that we see are something like a dream, but it's a very lovely dream, so let's step into it now. And what we see in the prints that we have of Edo is an incredible, vibrant, flourishing city, an incredible, prosperous city. And we can follow it through all the shifting seasons. We can see parades of bright-faced beauties and smiling children here shopping for fabrics at the Ebisuya store. We can see wonderful child prodigies. This is a young girl called Shima Emo, who was particularly talented and gifted, and she's re leading a private reading lesson. So while she sits and reads aloud at the lectern, the girls around recite along with her, following the text in their books. Um, just to make sure we know just how talented and precocious this child is, there's a little mention in the background here, um, of both the Sekishu School of Tea Practice and the Bishouryu School of Flower Arrangement. So we're reminded that her talents don't just lie in reading, she's an incredibly cultivated and bright young girl. 
Um, we also see incredible festivals ringing through the streets. And this is actually a parade float for the Kanda Festival. Kanda Festival being one of the biggest three festivals in Edo. Um, it's a shrine in particular that honours um, gods who guarded both the shogunate and the townspeople. So it has a real uh, resonance across the city. And as a rare honour, it had official appointment, which meant that the floats were allowed to enter the precinct of Edo Castle. But each time that they went through the streets, they rejuvenated the city, they brought prosperity, they brought good luck. Um, and we see all kinds of beautiful things in print. We see incredibly beautiful lovers. In this case, all the lovers shown in these prints have adopted the disguise of itinerant monks. Uh, these monks are known as komuso, and they carry flutes but they also carry you can see in this one here on the right um, these giant sort of basket things that they have down to their sides are actually hats that they would wear and these large basket like hats would actually cover your face and the rules were that basically you could never ask a commissar to remove their hat so if you ever wanted to travel incognito in the Edo period, this is the garb you wore. But in this case, the young lovers that we're looking at are so beautiful that it would be an absolute travesty to conceal their beauty with hats. So we get to enjoy their beautiful faces instead. And we even see samurai themselves in prints. So here again, we have an incredible picture of debonair elegance at the hand of Utamaro, this beautiful young samurai carrying a falcon on his wrist, uh, joined by a lovely female companion who's just stepping out of her palanquin. I'm sure many of you will have seen at the National Museum of Ireland, they have one of these incredible palanquins. And if you haven't seen it, do go and look because it is gorgeous lacquered palanquin. And they've just paused on their way through the countryside, stepping out of the boat. They're going to travel off into the hills to practice falconry. And in the background there, you may just be able to make out on the right the elegant peak of Mount Fuji. And that's not to mention the busy traders and the sideshow performers. So Edo is really just a riot of things happening, distractions, the places to go, people to see, and what better place to go than the sweet shops. Uh, so here in the print on the left, we have the stand for Ikuyo mon Mochi. So if anyone has eaten Mochi, it's a sweet, uh, not very sweet, sweet, made of pounded rice. Um, and then we also have here Kawaguchi, the candy vendor. On the right, we have have one of the sort of notable celebrities you might find on the street and this is the street performer Matsukawa Tsurukichi who came to Edo from Nagoya in the 1760s or 70s and was praised for his astonishingly realistic imitations of kabuki actors especially Ichikawa Daozo, Yaozo whose voice he could carry off with a plomb um, and he was also strangely credited as setting a trend for very thin overplugged eyebrows and this, in a way, was what the shogunate had somewhat unwittingly created through encouraging urbanization, through the system of alternate attendants that brought um, the feudal lords from the provinces and all their retinues into the city on alternate years, from the highways that they had um, helped establish and secure to ensure that they had control over their country and from the peace that obviously supported their rule they created all the elements you needed for great prosperity for great trade for great wealth to develop and also the rapid growth of a economy within that people moving needing goods in the cities bringing those things from other places the merchants who were technically right at the bottom of the social order in the Edo period which is you'll remember is warriors first, then farmers, then artisans, then merchants. The merchants who are right at the bottom are actually making huge amounts of money. And so we do have incredible prosperity. And with that prosperity, it's Edo, so it's also always incredibly playful. And so one of the hallmarks of floating world writing and art is the juxtaposition of this low city culture, you know, you're low in status as a townsperson, but you can enjoy the allusion to high culture of classical literature, but generally it's often done in quite a tongue-in-cheek way. So we have women of the brothel district recast as celebrated poets of centuries past, and time-honored tropes are really brought up to date, put in new fashions, reinvented, um, repurposed to help really sort of push into this incredible vibrant world that relies on shared knowledge, or really to put it another way, inside jokes. 
But while all this is going on, while there is all this energy, while there is all this dynamism and vibrancy and prosperity, there's other things happening too. And people weren't always laughing. So there are three particular moments in which um, the Edo publishing industries are um, brought into wider moments of reform. So the Tokugawa shogunate has brought Japan out of a period of incredible conflict. Um, they really sort of came through at the end of the 16th century and reunified a country that was tearing itself apart in places. Um, <clears throat> and they wanted to hold on to that stability and that security. And so there are moments in the history where everything is great, everything is rosy and things get quite lax and culture flourishes. And then there are other moments when, particularly if there are poor harvests, rice riots, things like this, and that stability starts to be threatened, then the government clamps down. And they clamp down on the publishing industries among all the other things that they're clamping down on to keep the status quo as they want it. So there's three particular moments for prints um, where those wider reforms really impact upon publishing as well, both of prints and printed books. And the first of these is particularly around 1722, and these are the Kyoho reforms. And this is sort of the first major um, sort of uh, circumscription of commercial publishing, secular publishing. And they implement that publications need to be approved by a publishers association or guild rumors current events unduly luxurious or immoral works should not be produced there should be no mention of the tokugawa shogunate or other high-ranking ancestral lineages and the names of author artist and publish all need to be included on newly printed works and these reforms came out um, at a time of much wider agrarian and financial reforms, looking to curb luxury in a time of economic problems. Um, and the punishments that generally take place around this cite issues that are things that are detrimental to public morality or things that tend towards excessive opulence. But then the publishers also find ways around it. So in terms of not being allowed to uh, print things around current events, you put it into a false historical setting, you change the names, you do what you can, and depending on how tough the authorities are being and clamping down, sometimes you can get away with it. Um, in the 1760s and 1770s, these rules hadn't gone away, but the enforcement of them had. And that's when you get the birth of the full colour print and samurai really engaging and responding to floating world culture. And that's exactly the time that you get prints like this. But then again, we have another period. So in 1787, there is a lot of riots after a series of poor harvests meant that rice prices had gone very high. And so basically, there's another set of reforms, particularly citing a return to the Kyoho reforms and need to reinstate those rules that were already there, but to bring them back into play. In the 1790s, this starts to impact more on publishing as well. And in 1790, we get very specific statements towards publishing. And part of the thought of what may have stimulated this is that some of the floating world uh, writers and artists were sort of parodying some of the things that were being said by the government in their need to reform. So in order to sort of push back on these satirical responses, um, prints from this point on have to carry a seal, a stamp, to show that the censors had approved it. Um, nothing should be made that's excessively luxurious, but also nothing, they say, insolent works for children. And this is really referring to one of the ways that these satirical works disguise themselves. They disguise themselves as a sort of playful children's book, when actually it was quite strong political satire. The other thing that happens with the Kansei reforms, and it's not just to do with publishing, but more widely, is that the samurai are really sort of pushed out of the floating world. The government don't want them engaging in what they see as frivolous pursuits. So whereas samurai had been really sort of important figures in poetry circles, in other things that are very closely tied into Edo publishing, very big parts of the floating world, that was very strongly discouraged. And so they start sort of pulling back out of that world a little bit at that time. 
Um, the last major set of censorship um, reforms that come in are in the 1840s, and these are the tempo reforms. Again, this is a response to responding to an earlier famine in the tempo era, and they take particularly strict action on the floating world. Gambling is banned, hairdressing is banned, unlicensed prostitution, which has never been legal, is banned even more so. Um, examples are made as well. The very famous actor Ichikawa Dandro VII is banished from Edo for his luxurious lifestyle. For prints, they ban depictions of actors, prostitutes, and the skilled entertainers known as geisha. And obviously these, as you'll have seen in the talks I've done so far, these are some of the key players for print subjects. So it's a very big thing for the publishing industry to be told you can't do depictions of actors anymore. This is a main source of their income. The price of prints is also limited. It's capped at 16 mon per sheet. And this is where we get our oft quoted thing of a bowl of noodles because 16 mon was also, as it happened, the price of a bowl of noodles. Um, but even these reforms, you know, after 1850, they're broadly disregarded. And even before that, the publishers are finding ways that they can do things that obey the letter of the law, but still satisfy the needs of their audiences. So just to give a couple of other examples, so other works that were banned in the Edo period included calendars. So calendars um, could only be produced by 11 designated publishers in Edo from 1716. And what we see then is sort of a couple of times where there's this fashion for picture calendars called Ego Yomi. And these are privately published prints in which the calendar information is incorporated into the design. So and at this point, following the lunisolar calendar, so a calendar that's set by the phases of the moon, but also tracking um, the annual course of the sun. And so all you need to know in a lunisolar calendar is, is it a long month or a short month? And so what we have here on the back of this lovely um, uh, paper mounter who's repairing a folding screen, um, you can just see here that these little circles each of these contains a number. So first of all, we have the character big at the top, and that is showing that these are the numbers for the long months. We have sho, the first month, the sixth month, the ninth month, the twelfth month, the eleventh month. So we know by looking at the picture which months are long, and then by extrapolation, which months are short. We also have a little section of an almanac here pasted as if it's the pa recycled paper that's been pasted onto the back of the screen, which is really quite beautiful. Um, and the authorities were also always keeping a close eye because obviously the publishers were always looking for new things that would catch people's attention. So the big innovations of the 1790s is um, what are called big head portraits or kubie. And these big head portraits are particularly of actors. So we have these incredible, um, very dynamic actor portraits by an artist called Toshusai Sharaku. And Sharaku is one of those artists about very little known, very little indeed is known. Uh, his style is entirely unique. His pictures are almost caricature-ish. They're not especially flattering. And it's been wondered whether it's the lack of flatteringness that may have led him to not continue in this particular career. Um, but they're so dynamic and they're so eye-catching for it. And so here we have him doing a portrait of the actor Iwai Hanshiro IV, uh, one of Edo's most famous onnaga onnagata, so an actor who would specialize in female roles. And that's why he's wearing here the Murasaki Boshi, the purple cap that is that really distinctive mark of the onnagata actor. And then, of course, beautiful women. So on the right there, we have a lovely uh, image of Takigawa of the Ogiya house in Yoshiwara. And this is by the artist Chobun Sai Eishi. And of course, the other artist who is particularly famous at this time for beautiful women is Utamara. Um, and so one of the things that comes in in 1793 is that you aren't allowed to put on prints the names of women other than the prostitutes of the Yoshiwara, the Yujo. And it's thought this may have been to protect reputations of other women. Another suggestion is it may have actually been to deter uh, printmakers from putting the names of unlicensed prostitutes onto their prints, um, and so promoting the trade in unlicensed prostitution. Um, but in this case, uh, what we have here is a print of a beautiful singer, a lovely famous singer called Tomimoto Toyohina. So if you're not allowed to include her name, how do you tell people who she is? 
Well, the way you do that in Utamano's case is with a picture viewers, so a series of little picture puzzles. So here, um, where you would normally get, so this is the series title written out here, uh, renowned beauties likened to six immortal poets. And then here we have a series of clues as to what her name is. And literally, it's just a case of reading them out. So first of all, we have a lottery box uh, for a lottery, so that's Tommy. Uh, duckweed and a whetstone, that is Mop and Top. A sliding door, Top. A lantern to suggest night, which would be Yo. And a little doll there, so that's Hina. So we have Tommy, Moto, Toyo, Hina. And then we know exactly who it is. And this is the kind of little game that would be readily recognisable to those in the know. And so this is something that uh, Utamaro starts doing after the 1793 ban on including these names, and in 1796 picture weavers are banned. And then in 1800 the big head portraits themselves are banned, and at the time the authorities sort of admitted in some documents that they didn't really have a good, a strong reason as to why these were bad, but they were just too conspicuous. And it's this sort of idea of luxury, this idea of things being too conspicuous is often what causes the authorities ire as much as satire, as much as things that could be seen as heterodox or somehow seditious. And so we get this sort of, at times, almost a cat and mouse game between the publishers and the authorities. Um, and speaking of mice, I of course have to include my very favourite book in the collection, the lovely titled Fat Tales of Lucky Mice, a two volume book from 1804. And it's actually a story that's all told with these lovely white mice. There's a love triangle, all kinds of amazing things happen. And it's also a very rare book. And it's very rare because soon after it was published, um, the magistrates ordered that the colour blocks for its printing be destroyed. And the reason for that was it was too luxurious. And this is actually around the same time as one of the most famous cases of censorship in the floating world prints. Um, the most high profile of all the cases is the one that affects Utamaro. This is also in 1804. Now in Utamaro's case, he wasn't um, censured for the luxury of his prints. He was censured more around the subject material. So at this time, there was a very popular illustrated biography of the 16th century warlord Toyotomi Hideyoshi. And this book became an absolute bestseller, made its way into kabuki, made its way into jurori ballad dramas. And so Utamaro and a number of his colleagues created some prints and other things that capitalized on what was clearly a popular subject. But technically, you weren't meant to be um, showing these people. It was a banned subject. Um, but also what's thought now in recent scholarship is possibly it wasn't just that it was a banned subject, but that they were making this 16th century warlord, this very important figure, very important predecessor in the history of the Tokugawa shoguns as well, um, making him part of the floating world, bringing him into a space where he didn't belong. And that in itself was seen as damaging. And once this caught the attention of the authorities, um, not only was Utamaro sentenced, but for the other works produced, and it wasn't necessarily this work, we don't know exactly which work of Utamaro's it was that was censured, because he did a number of works around this time, um, but four other artists were also sentenced, a writer and their publishers. So while it was something of a cat and mouse game at times, the consequences could be very serious indeed. Um, and really for the shogunate, their goal is to keep the status quo. Um, in the case of things that were too luxurious, this is almost something we need to sort of explain today because the idea of a sumptuary law in a world that's sort of driven by the gears of capital is pretty alien and it's basically saying that depending on your class or your status you're prohibited from owning certain goods you're prohibited from living too luxurious a life consuming things that are too lovely or flashing your money too audaciously and this is one of the real things that gets to the shogunate is people not behaving as they feel that status of person should and it's particularly exacerbated because at the top of the scale, you have the samurai warriors, many of whom are actually quite economically doing badly at this time. And at the bottom of the scale, you have the merchants who through the peace, who through the prosperity are becoming fantastic. Um, and the consequences for 
flouting these rules could be exile, fines, arrest, destruction of products. But one of the things that's actually quite interesting in terms of prints and printed books is while they might order that the printing blocks be confiscated or destroyed, they generally didn't recall the prints or the printed books themselves. So we often have surviving examples of the prints that later attracted the authorities' ire. So we can appreciate perhaps that when we see these resoundingly positive images of Edo in print, that not only were these things that were intended to appeal, to attract and to seduce old horses, as they still do very much today, they're also things that are sometimes skirting quite difficult and fine lines with censorship with the authorities, depending on the time. Um, so we're balancing both the aspirations and pride of this very dynamic townsperson audience with the wider social context that they're in. So I'd like to sort of focus on something slightly different, and that is Edo again itself. So as I said in the beginning of these talks, Edo at this time is still a fairly young city. In 1590, it's little more than a fort and a village. It becomes a castle town for the shogunate and then it rapidly rapidly grows to have more than a million people in 150 years um, but compared to kyoto which was the ancient capital heiankyo and even osaka this merchant center with its own long proud history and it was still something of a new arrival um, so the city as well as skirting all these different lines between prosperity between censorship between status and consumption is also looking to identify itself. And one of the things that is very much a feature of the Edo publishing industry is uh, Edo-centrism, this sort of focus on Edo. Um, so it is a new arrival, but there's also a history there that it can adopt because while Edo may be a new city, this place in which it's set has its own history. And part of that um, comes from things like the Tales of Ise, where the courtiers travel out um, up into these remote eastern lands, as this area would have been at the time, called Azuma, and they see this beautiful landscape. But also more than that, and probably most importantly of all, is Mount Fuji. And you can see lovely Fuji just here at the back of this print. And it's no coincidence really that when Fuji was given UNESCO status, it was given this status on the basis of its cultural significance, not on its place in the natural world or scientific, but on its cultural history. And we have it here in our own beautiful scrolls of the tale of the bamboo cutter, because Mount Fuji appears in the 10th century story which, of the tale of the bamboo cutter. And of course, as you'll all know, this is the moon princess who's found in a stalk of bamboo raised by the bamboo cutter and his wife and in the final climactic scene while she's being taken back to the moon by this little carriage and this amazing colored cloud on the right um, the emperor takes the elixir of immortality and throws it into Mount Fuji and we can just see Mount Fuji's white peak there on the left and Fuji has been observed in Japan for centuries you know, long before Edo was a thought, long before anything else, Fuji has this incredible history because it is such an incredible sight. This amazing sort of perfect conical shape, the highest mountain in Japan, and just aesthetically incredibly beautiful, but also in a country um, where the indigenous religion is looking very much at the spirit of places. Fuji is incredibly important. And Fuji was, of course, observed by poets, here observed in turn by Hokusai in his exquisite volumes, 100 Views of Mount Fuji. And this beautiful set of books catches Fuji in various moments, various guises and various atmospheres, but it also really draws out the spiritual and historical significance of this incredible mountain. And this particular image is titled Fuji of Letters. And here on the left, we have the eighth century poet, Yamabe Akahito, and he's gazing out, sort of crossing through time in a way, onto this scene of boatmen under the gaze of Fuji. 
And Yamabe Akihito composed a very famous poem on Mount Fuji, which is included in the Manyoshu, or Collection of 10,000 Leaves, which is Japan's oldest poetry anthology, thought to have been compiled around 759 AD. And this is one of the earliest descriptions of Mount Fuji. And so I'll just quote the translation of the poem by Joshua Mosto. Um, and it is coming out from Tago's nestled cove, I gaze, white, pure white, the snow has fallen on Fuji's lofty peak. And the poem is also featured in the popular anthology, 100 Poets, One Poem Each, which is where that translation is from. So for all the playfulness of Edo prints, there's also, I would say, a real sincerity in developing a sense of place for this young city. And this literary past, this immortal mountain, seen by all who would make the journey from the imperial capital up to the shogun's stronghold, is really fundamental to the pride of Edo. It's a peerless mountain, it's also an incredibly powerful mountain, and that power is captured most dramatically in this image. Um, let's see if I can just zoom in here. There we go. Um, and you can see the energy, the shock, the destruction. And this is a scene of Fuji's eruption in 1707, the last eruption of Fuji. Fuji has not erupted since 1707, but it is not a dormant volcano either. Um, and this massive eruption created a bump on the side of this gigantic mountain. And Hokusai also shows the bump and travelers gazing at it in the next scene. Obviously Hokusai, despite being incredibly long lived, was not around in 1707. So this is drawn from his imagination. And actually one of the things um, that's quite surprising, despite the amount of times we see Fuji in art, we don't see these scenes. We see scenes of related to earthquakes and fires that were very culturally part of life in Edo. Fires and fights were among the flowers of Edo. And, but we don't see this kind of energy of Fuji, but it's part of Hokusai's portrait of the mountain that he does in these incredible books is the strength of this mountain. Um, but it's also slightly to do with the resilience, you know, despite this destruction, Edo came back. And Fuji, of course, is most famous from Hokusai's beautiful series, 36 Views of Mount Fuji. And there's a huge steer towards landscape prints from around the 1830s. And this is partly related to the availability of a specific pigment, Prussian blue, and it's known by some scholars as the Blue Revolution. And so Prussian blue is an incredibly versatile pigment. And it's used in Japan alongside two earlier pigments which have been used for a very long time in printmaking, and these are indigo and dayflower blue. Now each of these pigments has their downfalls. Indigo is quite costly to extract and has a slightly greyish tone. Dayflower blue gives a really beautiful almost sort of sky blue, but it's very vulnerable to light and vulnerable to humidity particularly. And if you remember in the last talk, the um, the scenes with the fans, the dayflower blue that has sort of turned to this buff beige colour. And that's one of the issues with dayflower blue. Um, but Prussian blue, of course, is a very useful pigment to have indeed. And it was actually known in Japan from the 18th century. It came in through the Chinese and also through the Dutch. And Apple, actually, in Japan, it's not called Prussian blue, it's generally called Bero Ai, um, Ai being blue and Bero coming from Berlin, Berlin. So, and this is because this is the name that the Dutch were using for it at the time. So even though it's been known in Japan for a long time, it's really sort of at the end of the 1820s, around 1830, that the price drops to a point where it is suddenly much more usable. And one of the real beauties of this um, pigment is that it allows incredible graduations of color, what's called bokashi in Japanese, it has very fine particles that make it very suitable for giving these very sort of gentle moves from blue to white. Um, it's also very strong in terms of light. It's a very versatile, very useful pigment. Doesn't mean that indigo or dayflower blue stop being used. Sometimes they're used together. Um, 
but it does give a new opportunity because for the sky and for the sea, blue is a very important colour. And so this interest in landscape really continues. And we have a whole series of prints capturing the idea of travel. And that's partly because the shogunate creating these highways, the post stations, the towns where you could stop and rest, the towns where things would be checked, the towns where you'd uh, get something to eat. All of these places became sort of part of the cultural geography of Japan. And there's also more travel happening in the Edo period. So partly this is, again, the shogunate, their system of alternate attendants, bringing all these feudal lords and their enormous retinues to Edo every other year. Uh, people traveling on official duties and a sort of centralization of things. Um, obviously, merchants were also among the groups allowed to travel and they would be traveling, developing trade networks, um, monks, and also pilgrims. And it's this last category, the pilgrims, that is one of the things that really sort of takes off in the late Edo period, particularly pilgrims traveling to the shrines of Ise. And that brings sort of a new interest in travel, a new interest in place and the wider space of Japan. And another thing that's very important in this is peace. Because there is peace, because the feudal lords aren't fighting with each other, Travel is a much more uh, attractive prospect for people to do. And travel is also, in some ways, uncontroversial subject matter. So in the 19th century, as well as this boom in landscape prints, we see a lot of prints of warriors, ancient warriors from stories, uh, bird and flower subjects. And it's possibly also something to do with a sort of preempting the authorities in a way and it's thought that maybe by choosing less controversial subjects things would be more readily accepted so from the pigments from the social interest in travel the economic aspects of bringing things into an affordable price bracket and the political aspects of censorship we get all these elements tangling together um, in landscape prints particularly but then we also of course have personal things too. And for Hokusai and Fuji, it's not so much that Hokusai is looking to create images of landscape, he's creating images of Fuji. And Fuji has particular meaning to this artist who at the time he's doing these images, um, the 100 books of Mount Fuji, uh, the 100 views of Mount Fuji, the 36 views of Mount Fuji. He's in his 70s. And Fuji, this incredible mountain, has a particular association in Japan with long life, longevity. It's known as the Immortal Mountain. And it's an incredible spiritually powerful place. And for Hokusai, it's that um, spiritual aspect of Fuji that was also incredibly important in his work. So we get the social, the economic, the technological, the political, all of these things come together in terms of the things we now see as images of Edo. And in its prosperity, in its resilience, in its dreams, in its journeys, and even here in the broiled eel that makes it smell like home, prints help define what it means to belong to Edo. It's not just a place. Um, we have this lovely phrase, Edo Mae, made in Edo, and that's used here for the eels which will be fished in Edo Bay. We also have the Edoite, the child of Edo, known in Japanese as Edo Ko. And the Edoko is something that we see in literature defined at the end of the 18th century. The child of Edo should have their first bath in the water from the city aqueduct. They should grow up in sight of Edo Castle. They should have a childhood of comfort, unlike country bumpkins. The child of Edo is very happy to spend his money. He's a downtown to the core and he has incredible spirit and resolve. And in the 18th century is something that's generally associated with the more affluent reaches of the townspeople. And in the 19th century, it broadens out to the lower ranks of townspeople as well. And this is in a way much like the London Cockney, born in the sound of bow bells and seemingly living on a diet of jellied eels, or indeed the dub, born in the rotunda or hollis, depending on your stance on the north-south divide, known to jump off the 40-foot 
and feel a sense of place at the site perhaps of the Poolbeg Towers or when the wind catches the fragrance of the Guinness Brewery. And it's all sort of about these other aspects, what binds a local identity. And for me, that's what Edo's prints are incredibly rich in. So when we see the places of the city, its proud landmarks, its boisterous crowds, all of which were set out long before the triumph of landscape prints, it's more than a sense of place, it's a sense of lived place. And it's the quiet narrative that we see in each image that really offers that sense of lived place and indeed community. So when we follow the shared glances, I'm going to try doing that here if I can. There we go. So if we follow the shared glances through the print, hopefully it'll work, there we go, not as good. Um, then we get a sense as we go from cat to woman to woman and up to the cuckoo in the top there, as we go from the child reaching up to his mother or the people just talking to the side. As we follow these glances through, we're almost like we're catching them in a moment of conversation. We can experience the, the summer heat that's making her bring the fan so close, that's making them loosen their robes. We can experience the fresh promise of spring or a lazy day beneath autumn leaves. And what we have really is an entirely beautiful gloss on quite everyday things. The mundane world is refined and aestheticized to exquisite perfection. And so for me, Edo is not just a place or landmarks, it is something incredibly beautiful, incredibly bold, and full always of happy chatter. So while it's a bit damp, it's starting to brighten up a bit now, which is good, for a last memory of summer heat, we'll just go to this little scene of fireworks. So summer in Japan is the season for fireworks. And here we have a city produced in print, humming with people, pulsing with life, rushing, racing, dancing and dashing, and here standing for a moment, pausing, everyone taking one breath, as the fireworks flood the night sky with light and with colour. So for me, Edo in Prince is really a shared city, a place of community, of dynamic actors, of beautiful women, people, culture, energy, all colliding together, tempered always by political and social realities, it's not quite real, it's almost real, and it's endlessly enticing. It's a dream and nothing more in a way in glorious Technicolor. And this compelling power that the prince would have exerted in the Edo period is something they still exert today. It's still a very enticing dream. And that for me is really the essence of Edo in colour. Edo is produced in print. And the next talk, we will be fast forwarding 100 years to the foundation of the Chester Beatty Library. And that is the very moment in which Sir Alfred Chester Beatty himself goes crackers over Japanese prints. So I'll stop there. Thank you.